Good afternoon, this is Anna Nichenko on UATV English, breaking hard truths in easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers continue their offensive, liberating the Ukrainian land from the occupiers. And unlike the Russians, who all winter tried to capture one city, Bakhmut, and threw all their forces there, Ukrainian soldiers are recapturing their territory in several directions at once. There is progress near Robotina, Opetna and Klishivka. This is three different directions and everywhere Ukrainian armed forces are in advance. I held a military cabinet meeting, a special circle of participants. We only discussed the situation at the front and our expectation for the near future, strengthening of our brigades, our own production of weapons and ammunition in Ukraine, and supplies from our partners, important intelligence reports. We can clearly see what the occupiers are really preparing for and what our warriors should be ready for. Ukrainian troops have to overcome dense of fortifications and mine barriers. The defense forces are expanding the operational zone in the Black Sea. Marine mining platforms near the western coast of Crimea have returned under Ukraine's control. Ukraine is very grateful for the support of all its allies and experts to finally receive long-range missile attacks, as well as to quickly introduce F-16 aircraft into battle in order to dramatically change the situation on the battlefield. Even today's heat on the Sevastopol Bay is a consequence of the successful work of the Ukrainian Air Force. It is most likely that these were missiles provided by our Western partners thanks to the existing aircraft. However, the F-16s made these strikes even more frequent and effective. Kyiv clearly abides by its obligations regarding military aid from the West. Weapons from partners are used for defense against Russian attacks, as well as to liberate occupied territories within internationally recognized borders. Today, a meeting between the dictators of North Korea, Kim Jong Un, and Russia, Putin began at the Eastern Cosmodrome in the Amur region of the Russian Federation. Six years ago, Vladimir Putin signed a decree introducing sanctions against North Korea in response to the country's nuclear missile test. And now two dictators are meeting together. Russia is becoming more and more like North Korea. It is becoming a closed, militarized, ideological and backward society. They definitely have a lot of common ground in that regard. Putin is eager to gain access to North Korea's large arsenals of munitions, as aggression against Ukraine has already depleted Russian stockpiles. Thanks to the North Korean artillery projectiles, the Russians hope to return to the volley fire tactic in the war with Ukraine. So as for me, now Ukraine, with the help of its Western partners, should prepare an adequate response. Instead, Kim Jong Un expects to receive missile technologies from Russia, as access to them was denied for two decades of United Nations sanctions. Russia is capable of assisting North Korea's nuclear and intercontinental ballistics missile programs that can deliver a nuclear warhead to the U.S. mainland. Moscow cooperation with Pyongyang and Tehran creates new global threats. The Mossad has already admitted that the missiles that the Kremlin transfers to Tehran pose a threat to Israel. So now it's time for South Korea and Japan, and maybe the whole world, because two dictators with nuclear warheads are much more dangerous than one dictator. Victory over the Russian aggressor is in the interest of the entire civilized world. The USA is investigating the possibility that Elon Musk sabotaged Ukraine's military operation in Crimea by denying access to Starlink Internet services. As was reported earlier in Elon Musk's news biography, he secretly ordered the shutdown of Starlink near Crimea last year to thwart a Ukrainian attack on the Russian Navy. 
And it is noted that Musk allegedly feared that Moscow would respond to the Ukrainian attack on Crimea with nuclear weapons. According to the author of the biography, the fear was caused by the billionaire's conversations with high-ranking Russian officials. Now, Elon Musk himself declared that the Ukrainian state authorities received an urgent request to activate Starlink all the way to the city of Sevastopol, temporarily occupied by the Russians. And Musk said that he didn't turn on the Starlink satellite internet system in the area of the next Crimea due to U.S. sanctions against Russia. And that's why he didn't turn off the internet near Crimea, but simply didn't turn it on by request. Yes, it is possible, but let's hope that the investigation initiated in the U.S. will find out what was the root cause and who did or did not do something. I don't know if it is just a coincidence, but tonight Starlink completely stopped working for an hour at the time of the impact on Sevastopol Bay. Currently, the company is dealing with the reasons, but these events are very ambiguous. Because in wartime, Starlink is a vital tool for communication among Ukrainians, and especially for the communication of the military in their efforts to protect the entire territory of Ukraine. And Crimea is an internationally recognized territory of Ukraine, which Ukrainian soldiers are fighting to free from the Russian occupation. Military actions of Ukraine in Crimea aren't a factor of escalation. None of the Ukrainian operations forced Russia to do something it had not done before. All of Ukraine's military efforts are aimed at reducing Russia's ability to continue an aggressive war thus bringing peace and stability closer. No billionaire, not even Elon Musk, can decide how Ukraine should conduct its war or defense. He is not a politician or an official. It was Anna Nichenko on UATV English hoping to give you the hard truths in easy enough terms on our daily wrap-up today. Comment, like and subscribe. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Your opinion matters a lot to us. Stay safe and turned for more tomorrow. See you.